Welcome back to Highly Respected. I'm your host, Scott Greer, and today we're going to have another incredible and fantastic episode for you guys today. So we're not going to be discussing, uh, for at least for the main topic, the campaign, because sometimes it gets a little bit... Uh, Sounds like we're repeating ourselves in this week. We'll have many, many more episodes to talk about the campaign in America. But today I want to talk about a topic of something that of events that happened last week, but we didn't really get to much of a chance to talk to. Or with one topic I want to expand on that I talked about in the IQ supplement. And it's dealing with a new book. It also covers with a new book I read about modern Germany. And that book is Out of the Darkness... The Germans, 1942 to 2022, by Frank Trentmann. And all this can come together to have a topic discussing Germany and what modern Germany is like, post-war Germany. What are some of the myths and misconceptions around it? And how that deals with a lot of the arguments that we've been seeing over World War II and the importance of, the, of that event for the modern West. And also that brings up the AFD's recent election victories in Thuringia and Saxony. Even though it wasn't quite a victory in Saxony, but all near victory in Saxony, uh, even with the victories, they're probably not going to be uh, the dominant partner in the state um, coalitions because all the state party, all the other German parties are like, we're not allowing the AFD in. So they're going to be excluded, but they still got the most amount of votes in Thuringia and Probably uh, there appeared to might be some shenanigans in Saxony uh, that prevented them from having the most amount of votes. But still, it's a huge victory from, you know, in the, you know, just in the last decade that there was like no far right, no real far right in Germany to this party that only emerged in 2013. And it began as just an EU skeptical party that was like, we're just about economics. And then it turned into a strong, solid nationalist party. And now it's getting the most votes in German states and it's competing at a national level as well. It did very well in the EU uh, parliamentary elections as well earlier this year. And that's worth assessing what Germans are like uh, and what the German type of mindset is in post-war modern Germany. Mindset and what it's like and how it is hostile to nationalism and these ideas of that are with the AFD. And there's like a deep horror for nationalists. I mean, there you know, nationalists throughout Europe are controversial, but in Germany, they seem it, that's like the real boogeyman for them. And this is based on a lot of how national identity has been built up in the last 80 years in Germany and how they conceive themselves and what it means to be a good person in Germany and what the Germans are like. And so this book, Out of the Darkness, you know, it just came out this year. It's pretty good. The thing to note is that Trentmann is very much a lib, um, even more so than a lot of other academics. Because he talks a lot about, oh, you know, we need to worry about right wing violence. And he even's like, you know, they talk about all the left wing terrorism in the 60s and 70s, but they don't talk about the right wing terrorism. And he's always trying to investigate how like Germans are not being uh, welcoming enough to migrants. You know, you see a lot of that. But in essence, he definitely capture, captures the German mentality post-war and what it's like. And I think an important part of this is that, that you'll see from this is that Germans are deeply moral people in a way. I mean, everyone has a sense of morality, but as a society, they want to have a perception that we are doing something good and noble. And that there is, you really have to be seen, you know, even with their politicians and commentators, they make a lot of like philosophical or theoretical arguments in order to get people to do things. You know, they even have ministers who are making these philosophical arguments for why there should be lockdowns and you should get the jab. And that's just not going to happen in America, <laughs> you know, in the Anglosphere. If somebody was making philosophical arguments, you know, if we had even like a senator doing that, everyone would be like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, we don't like the theoretical arguments. We are purely pragmatic practical people, you know, and really a lot of our arguments are more utilitarian. With them, they have to have to have this 
deep reasoning and uh, you know a certain appeal to I don't know if intellectual functions is the correct because it's not like everyone is uh, deep into philosophy but they definitely rely a lot more on philosophical arguments even if it's more of a vulgarized philosophy but it's still more than what we would see in America to make their case for things and there's a deep reasoning for this and even in their constitution that they have they have adopted this ideas about human dignity and this very abstract conception of you know human rights in a way that it's not for America America it's like we're protecting your property and liberty Okay, we're not really putting in this human rights stuff, which in the, a lot of the human rights agenda and dogma and rhetoric has been used to argue for a lot of the woke stuff that we don't like. You know, the human rights campaign is the, lar is the largest uh, LGBT advocacy group. You know, they really like to appeal to that stuff. But in our constitution, our constitution is just very simple, practical, pragmatic. It's like, you know, property, certain liberties you have, you know, freedom of speech, this is that. And there's not really um, as much of a deep philosophical underpinning or, or something that you could extrapolate from that. But here, the German constitution, the basic law, they and, and we certainly don't have anything about human dignity. And so the core aspects of it are this, is that human dignity shall be inviolable inviolable <laughs> i'm probably mispronouncing that we even have trouble with english to respect and protect it shall be the duty of all state authority two the german people therefore acknowledge inviolable and inalienable human rights as the basis of every community of peace and justice and of justice in the world so i had some questioning whether i was pronouncing inviolable correctly but i you guys know what i'm saying any case, that is like something that is like not in our constitution. And it's something that is deeply rules German society. Because when even in America, when we have these arguments, it's about like my liberty to do stuff. And when Americans mindset around like how we practice as a society is, you know, mind your own business. Or as Tim Wall says, mind your own damn business and live and let live. Don't tread on me. It's imagining that, you know, the human person is wandering around and his main problem is the state or even maybe his community is trying to impose their will on him and the all american response is don't tread on me mind your own damn business and so we have that mindset that really we we're trying to protect the individual and his pursuit of whatever form of happiness he wants and we don't really have as much of a collectivist collective understanding of what we should do as a society i mean we have fundamental moral precepts of things you know of that we can appeal to is but generally when we do that and it's not as like a collective thing of like for the common good or even expecting people with fundamental duties to society and, and community it's more about focusing solely on individual rights and a person to live however they seem to be fit, as long as they're not hurting anyone, which is now what they're using for, um, as I argued in my column last week about weed, is like how weed is becoming a big thing. You know, it's like, well, it's not hurting anyone, so they can toke up whenever. So it's very much individual oriented. With Germany, it's still a lot more, I mean, it's not like saying it's not individualistic at all, but it has a much more communal model to it than it does with america and a lot of germans are very rules obsessed and are definitely uh, minding your business as anybody is my experience with germans as with people i know who live in germany they and especially with americans all every american who lives in germany i know complains about how germany's getting in their business you know and it'll be like minor things it'll be like they're wearing shorts when the rest of the town is not wearing shorts and that people will come up and like you're not supposed to wear, you're not supposed to wear shorts my german accent uh, imitation is not so good we'll work on that but they will like you know go up in there i've heard of people who have jaywalks in an area where they weren't <laughs> supposed to and then like there was all these townsmen who like chased them down to yell them you know there's a very much thing in america if we saw these things happen like if any american came up to another person to say wow you look like shit you're not supposed to wear that you know 
people would uh, fight you and you're not like you would be the asshole for doing that but in germany you know you are the asshole for not following um the herd for it's a very social conformist society i mean we are in a way but less so i mean it's like everyone's dressing like shit in their own respective fashion while meanwhile they're like there's a specific way to do these things and if you're not doing it the correct way they're going to come and impose their will on you and so with germany it also that and for people who live there for americans they say this is also particularly unbearable because the society has no grand ambitions for this is that their grand ambitions now i mean with after the completion of world war ii and the, just the total defeat of their people and their spirit and they've pretty much gave away any type of grand spirit or grand ambitions that they could have for germany or even any design to make a germany a great power instead they just settled for henpecking each other over how much they're recycling you know it's like you're not recycling enough you're not what we just saw helga she didn't recycle that we need we need to talk to her you know it's like this like um you know, it, it's something that Americans would get really pissed off about in the way that they accept. And, but they basically just, you know, have like recycling Gestapo to go and monitor each other and then um, nitpick each other and nag each other to recycle more. <laughs> and or, or there is that really funny story about this German autist who was traveling around the country to uh, report people for parking <laughs> tickets. And he was like traveling on a bike and he's in this most ridiculous outfit ever. And they're like, this is the most German guy ever. And they're uh, extreme sticklers for rules, but there's not like any grand uh, project for these rules. You know, they're just kind of stuck. You know, they, they kind of lost the, um, for any real high ambitions. And now they just left with what they have as modern German society. And so they still have a common good. And the common good is basically being a libtard um, for their society. Now, they, there is something that's illustrated by Trent Mon in his book is that even though they'll mouth like very liberal left wing platitudes about welcoming people and tolerating people and some and they can be morally convinced of this. And there is this attitude of like going out and helping uh people in a way that I don't think even is really with America. I mean, they're kind of like volunteer, volunteeristic spirit in Germany is probably a lot stronger than that. I mean, it's, but it's also because everyone's watching each other. It's like, hmm, you know, Hermann didn't, you know, Vaughn didn't uh, clean up enough trash in his, in his, uh, in his um, community service work this week. You know, it's more of like sort of like that, the social pressure and community pressure that they have, which in America, you just kind of left to do your own thing uh, for better or for worse. Um, so you so you have that. But at the same time, you know, they have this, you know, welcoming refugees and like, oh, and they have this big moral thing about it. But at the same time, they're not um, very welcoming of strangers. <laughs> and this includes not just you know, foreigners. This also includes like people from other parts of Europe. This even includes people from other parts of Germany. Uh, one thing I didn't realize in this book, which, you know, probably something I should have learned earlier is that, at how unwelcoming German towns were to these expelled Germans from the East. Because for those who might not know, I think most people know is that all ethnic Germans who were in Eastern Europe are in parts of or that were parts of Germany, but then were handed over to Poland, were expelled and sent into Germany. And these people would be settled in, you know, various parts of parts of Germany and in these in a lot of places with small towns. And a lot of the locals uh, hated them and treated them like shit. And they're like, oh, you have totally different diet, totally different traditions, completely different culture. And they were, <clears throat> they, this was not a refugees welcome moment for Germany. And there was a lot of hostility and tension and conflict between these two groups in a way that even with American experience, because I mean, some of these did speak a different, you know, some, some of the Eastern Europeans didn't even speak, or German, Ostdeutsch didn't speak very good German, or even if they spoke German. 
some, you know, they spoke a very different dialect. I mean, someone was like, they're from the Sudetenland. So they're, of course, speaking German, but it's a very different dialect. And they have a different culture than some of these places that they're settling. They even may practice, they may even be Catholic and they settle in a Protestant town. And so these people had very strong local traditions and culture and a sense of themselves. And then these outsiders move in and they're all pissed. And, you know, in some ways it's a right wing thing to exclude outsiders. At the same time, it can uh, be a little stupid if it's a part of their national community. But even this is in the case of, and because I've also know some other people have spent a lot of time in, in small town Germany, and they, they'll even say this like, you know, if you're an American and stuff, they'll, you know, you're never, no matter how well you speak German, they'll never be welcomed in. It was different in the cities. I mean, that's a, even the same throughout the West, is that generally cities are more welcoming to immigrants uh, of a sort, mostly for bad, and the small towns are less so. And that's So that's a lot of good if it's refugees. And some of that resistance is coming from, you know, small town Germany for, uh, and that's mostly good. But it's also the, there is an exclusionary aspect to this sense of Germanhood. And the only way that they are able to overcome that are and to kind of embrace a multicultural element is these moral arguments about are rather of how German national identity is defined. Because many several or several leading politicians and other major figures in Germany say German identity is found within Auschwitz. You know, this is where this is our founding myth is Auschwitz and the terror or the the terrible nature of the Third Reich and us having to overcome it. That is at the core of their founding identity. It's like very different from how America's founding identity is supposed to be where, you know, these men came together and then they promised all this great liberty and freedom. And that's what's upholding America. And that's the true core of American character. In Germany, it's, we did such a terrible thing in World War II and our whole history and our whole mission is to overcome that and to atone for that. And this is how they argued to take in these refugees. It's like, we're finally figured out a way to absolve our guilt for what we did in World War II by taking in these refugees. And so they got that warm, fuzzy feeling from taking in uh, a million uh, migrants and then causing all these problems for Germany. And even their outlook on the environment and some of the idiotic green energy policies they're pursuing like eliminating their nuclear power eliminating, eliminating their energy sources is done is like we are achieving a higher morality that is further distance from the horrors of the nazis and this is at the core of our being now and this is how we are operating as a country and so that makes it is the way is that a natural state of germany's is of germans is wanting to exclude outsiders and, you know, really strong sense of being of an ethnic identity and in a very strong local identity and regional identity. And they even feel that Germans from another area moving in can threaten that. They especially feel that with migrants moving in. But one, the moral arguments are the moral identity of Germans post-World War II acts as a way of subverting that or tamping down on that feeling in order to make them accept all these refugees as well as state persecution and their hate speech laws and all these other things because they are not really operating as a it, they've never really had free speech anywhere close to what america has i mean we see a lot of the examples today but they've always had idiotic free speech laws because germans have been able to sue and even a prison people for just things that offend them. There's been, there was these stories of, you know, various leftists who would have bumper stickers calling soldiers murderers. And, you know, a German soldier brought like these leftists there to say, this is hate speech. And then the court would uh, try to imprison those people for things like that. So it's not simply that it's like hate speech towards minorities. There's also in cases of just like offending any type of group or causing offense even to it, a person that they can say like that shirt offends me, I'm going to sue you or I'm going to try to get you arrested. And the government has has 
arrested people in the past who revealed state secrets or like journalists who's revealed state secrets. You could say that that's uh, happened in America to an extent. You could, well, Julian Assange, I don't think is, a, is not a citizen, but it was more like very standard American reporting practices on things that the government is doing that here would be, you know, the government would know that they can't really arrest them while in Germany they would obviously try to arrest them for saying, hey, you're not even supposed to report that. There's never been a real tolerance for free expression, free speech in Germany, especially if they feel it violates the common good or if somebody has a deep problem with it, you know, or this is offending too many people that we can take you to court to, to ban you or to fine you or to arrest you. And so this explains, a, you know, a lot of the, most of continental Europe has these type of laws, but probably in Germany, it's at the most extreme level, the most radical level. It's why, you know, Bjorn Höcke, who's one of the leaders of the AFD, you know, he keeps getting fined for saying, uh, all is for Deutschland. And they say uh, everything for Germany. And they're saying, oh, well, that's a Nazi slogan. So you can't say that. So they keep fine. And they find him a lot. Like, I think uh, one of the fines he got was like worth $30,000. Uh, and you, you, you know, that's a lot of money to be fined for just simply a statement you made. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's, a hefty pe that's a hefty penalty for someone. But that's just how they operate. And the language around human dignity generally leads to a lot of cringe aspects with Germany. Uh, Trimmount has a lot of examples of people having competing notions of human dignity. And this is also where a lot of their speech uh, censorship comes in. They're like, this thing I'm seeing from this other person on this person saying this in public violates my human dignity. I need to punish them. Or they'll just be compete or even like employment law and disputes among soldiers is handled among this value of human dignity. And there's an insanely funny story about this German sergeant who was in the army in the late sixties and the German army, you know, they're trying to have a anti-authoritarian mindset with the army. Cause they're like, Oh, you know, with the old Wehrmacht that led to not, that led to fascism. So we want to have more freedom and, and letting soldiers do what they want to, to, ex to express themselves so we have an anti-authoritarian model. And they had to come up with some idiotic philosophical um, principle, found core principle of the army, which in German is in era furung, furung, not the best pronunciation, but in era furung, and means inner leadership or inner direction. And in this is like every soldier is a democratic citizen and they, they need to be understand their duties and responsibilities as a democratic citizen and also their ability to speak up and and fit in with a liberal democratic order and so a part of this is that you can have your own hairstyle and you can sort of do things the way you want to as i said this goes against some of the idea of their collectivist mindset where they'll like you know nag each other and other things but you know they don't like to have like someone barking these orders in a way of like a top-down hierarchy. It's more that everyone comes together to nag someone to to change their behavior. Uh, you could almost say it's like being long housed here. But so a lot of the, in, in this is started in the 60s where soldiers were able to have long hair and not really follow proper discipline and other things. And uh, this created problems with some of the uh, more stodgy traditionalists. And so this sergeant had a driver with long hair and he really wanted him to cut his hair. And this guy was uh, a private of some sort or it was a subordinate rank. And the guy's like, no, it's a part of my human dignity to express myself through my long hair and the way I behave. And the sergeant was pissed off and he went to his superiors and like, well, you know, he's got a point. That's a part of his dignity. And then he's like, the sergeant, in order to counter that, it's like, it violates my human dignity to have a guy with long hair as my driver. This is upsetting me. So they uh, they had to figure out a solution. They just gave him a different driver. Uh, so this doesn't um, quite work to have a serious military. And most of the German military, in the 60s and 70s, they still had a, a serious military because it was the Cold War. American military advisors are ensuring that they're there because they're worried 
you know, they need to make sure that these guys can be prepared if case the Soviets cross into, into West Germany. So they were working on it. And they did have military conscription as well. They only got rid of it in 2011, which you could get out of it by doing community service. Um, but they still had it. And it, but it was more of a joke. It's not like American military. I mean, you're not going to have an effective fighting unit with inner leadership. You know, it's like you are top down order and authoritarianism is turning you into a functioning unit where individualism is displaced and you are all, you know, just a soldier within that unit and fighting and not going your own way. You know, you're going the way that you're ordered to do. But with Germany, they, um, this sounds uh, too much like fascism and they're trying to get rid of the fascist spirit and that has led to them having a joke of a military. So, and, but there's a ton of examples of just people using these arguments of human dignity and these are human rights that we must have. And this has also created arguments of around animal rights, which that also resulted around human dignity because they were arguing over allowing what pets should happen and people were like, it's a part of my human dignity to let my dog go wherever he please. And then people would be like, it violates my human dignity to have this dog poop on my lawn. So, and they're like, we need to ban pets. So most of the arguments all have uh, these things, which in America, it's just simply, yeah, we have our rights. It's like very much insistent on property rights. And, you know, a dog pooping on someone's lawn, generally, you know, the property owners and the right here because that's their property. You're supposed to respect the property. That's it. But it's not about uh, using these, like I said, these deep philosophical concepts are, I wouldn't say deep philosophical concepts, but these attempts at philosophical concepts, like if the army had like, our military had like inner leadership, this is how you got to be. Our people would be like, what? No, 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 no. It's a much more practical thing. They they come up with these buzzwords and stuff as they like to do because it's like government bureaucracy and all these consulting firms. They're like, oh, we've got a we've got a new buzzword, but generally it doesn't mean anything. It's just some bullshit people throw out there to sound like that they're doing some type of reform or doing some type of behavior. But it's much more practical and pragmatic in how we operate in a military or a police or what have you. No commanding officer is ever going to cite Hegel or Kant to argue for a, a certain policy. I would say this is mostly a good thing. You know, I mean, it makes it more interesting. You're like, hmm, that's something to think about. But I don't think uh, the only people we're ever going to cite is like Abraham Lincoln or, or George Washington. You know, we're not going to cite many uh, philosophical th figures. But there's like I've said a lot of the bad things about, you know, and this is specifically about West Germany. I think a thing I'm, I'm going to talk about is that a lot of these mindset has not stepped in or seeped in among East Germans to the extent because East Germans were living under a communist state where, you know, the communist state, you know, wanted them to be uh, really impose a fa anti fascist anti fascism as their ideology. But they saw this as like an imposed ideology on them and none of them believed it. And now they're probably more skeptical of even what Germany as a unified country, you know, as the Bundesrepublik, Republic is trying to impose on them. And they're more willing to call out the bullshit. And also it's it's a slightly, well, I don't know if slightly might be the right word, but it's less well off than West Germany. And it sees, it senses more of these problems that they're having to compete with migrants for jobs and housing. And they experience all these things and they, they haven't really experienced all the type of moral brainwashing about how they're personally responsible for all these terrible things that happened in World War II and that Auschwitz is the core of their identity. A lot of them are like, well, we, we suffered under the, under the communists. And even with a lot of the communists, they were not, com the East Germany was not supposed to be instilling guilt in the people. It was simply just saying all these evil capitalists and these handful of fascists took over the country and then they hurt the German people. And it's almost taking the blame away from the average German people and putting it on a handful of people, which a lot of West Germans even felt like. But as it over time, that circle, the 
the blame then extended to all Germans and that they all share in this guilt. While with East Germans, East German ideology and education was simply just saying, no, it's just a, these people, these capitalist fascist and the people were good they were they wanted communism so in a lot of ways that made uh that created a different mindset among the east germans versus the west germans but in any case one good a thing about west germany is that post-war they were very solid on immigration as official policy from the cdu the christian democratic union which was the dominant party it's still you could it's still even argue it's been mostly the most popular party in germany ever since the end of the war first chancellor conrad adenauer came from the cdu and as official policy they're like we are not a country of immigrants we are not a country of immigration this is our official policy and adenauer himself was had very racial views he would even say, you know, decolonization is going to be terrible for the white race. And we really don't want all these minorities coming into our country and views that. And he's considered, you know, they did a public poll. I think it was in the 2000s or 90s asking who are the greatest Germans and on hour got like the top spot. So one or two, I forget if it was Sophie Scholl got the top spot or second. Any case, he was seen as one of the greatest Germans and he was pretty committed to a, a racial understanding of what Germany should be. And his government's like, we don't want, you know, we're not a country of immigrants. And this is seeing the, what had happened with all these people who were Germans coming into Germany and having all this tension and conflict in these, <clears throat> in these towns and regions where they had moved in and they're like, oh, we don't like them. So they're like, okay, even allow, this is how they react to Germans who speak German. Now imagine how they're going to react to Italians or or Slavs and other groups that most of the, and these were most of the people that were having guest workers and especially Turks and others from even non-Europeans like this is probably not going to work for our society we're not as welcoming of a society as we want we want to insist on being who we are so when we're going to have immigration we're going to have these strict guest worker programs which these people are not going to really be, it's going to be very difficult for them to be eligible for citizenship. No one is really ever going to conceive, see them as German. They're just simply here to work and that's it. But they're never, they're going to be outside of society. We're not going to assimilate them. And, uh, and that's really what the policy was like for many, many years. I mean, they only began to change it. They loosened citizenship laws in 2000. They've been proposing a loosening, an even further loosening of citizenship laws now. And I had a check of it passed and it did pass and it's taken effect and it's even even worse. It now allows for dual citizenship, makes it even easier to grant, get citizenship for these foreigners. And so that's not very good. And it just took effect this summer. So there, um, it's definitely a huge change of how it was during the Cold War where, you know, they still insisted, you know, they may embrace like Auschwitz as the core of German identity and that they are this war guild and having to atone for it. But the same way, at the same time, they're trying to keep Germany German. It, it just doesn't, it's just not trying to be a great national state. It's just trying to recycle the most of any country. Uh, so you so that is a positive aspect but that began to change following the cold war and you know seeing these problems with immigrants are more immigrants coming here and then they're like well it's the moral and right thing to do to welcome them in and even the taking in the refugees was a huge moment for them because they were still even with the loosening of the citizenship law they were still having pretty strict immigration laws you know they're not welcoming in the whole world it's still pretty tough for these migrants to gain citizenship compared to other countries but then they're just like come on in syrians and all their muslims come on in we've got it we're we're so happy refugees welcome and then they welcome them them in so that was a complete reversal of how they had conducted these policies it's very different from america where america post-war you know, Truman, right after the war, was wanting to liberalize immigration laws. He said, like, it's right as us, the leader of the free world. We've got to welcome in all these displaced persons from Europe. And we've got to be the beacon of freedom. And Truman was 
essentially calling for something like the 65 Immigration Act in the late 40s. The, the problem is, is the rest of America still oppose it and many politicians still oppose it. And it wasn't until the 60s to where opposition had weakened to where they were able to pass these laws. But mass immigration and support for liberal immigration laws became government policy in the post-war era. With Germans, it's really only in the 21st century where they began to change their mindset on immigration. Even though they are definitely having more immigrants coming to Germany as, you know, uh, into the late 20th century with the 80s and 90s, and they're having much more um, national sentiment rising, and they're having more support for these far-right parties in the, in the 90s over this issue uh, of immigration. But they were, pro they were getting, you know, they still had stricter laws compared to certainly the United States and even to France and Britain. And they're getting, you know, a smaller percentage of immigrants than France and Britain. But that changed in the new millennium. And even with them, with the far right parties, a lot of the reasons that they never gained much in Germany was one, the national identity over being anti-fascist and being like, we can't have an, we can't be explicitly ethno-nationalist. We can only be implicitly ethno-nationalist. You know, we'll be like, oh, Germany's welcome for all. Then like, you know, Germans, we do not want Germans in our small town or, or non-Germans in our small town. Uh, you know, that, that type of, you know, it didn't, you know, far right parties were seen as too much, violated their idea of what the common good should be. And also the far right parties didn't really have much to run on at this time. And there was a brief time in the late 60s where it seemed that the uh, NPD, the National Democratic Party of Germany, which is one of those parties that was bad optics parties that the AFD uh, displaced. They're now called Heimat. And there was a point where they were worried that they might enter parliament. They might get the necessary 5% but they came short. And they were really just kind of running on anti-communism and, and worries over far-left extremism. But, you know, the CDU was also very anti-communist and anti-left-wing demonstrators, so there wasn't much ground for them to take up. They were, they were also much more insistent on uh, being opposed to the war guild and that uh, being the core, the founding national sentiment of, of a modern Germany. But that wasn't really as... Um, politically potent of an issue. So they struggle with that. And then in, the other issue that they had was reclaiming the like Silesia and other parts that were given to Poland. And this was a big right wing issue. And even some of the CDU were like, we are going to get, don't worry, we're going to get those, we're going to get those places back, even though they had been pretty much entirely de-Germanized. These expellees from those areas were wanting those back and they were uh, an important political interest group. Uh, throughout the Cold War. And that was probably the other issue of the far right, is getting those territories back. And there was the part, there was a party in the 80s and around the time of reunification that that was like their core issue, the Republicans, which they had split, people had split off from the CDU to form it. And they were really insistent, like, we've got to get these areas back. But when Helmut Kohl was negotiating reunification, he agreed that no, those territories are not ours anymore. They are Poland, and in the case of East Prussia, they are Russia's. We we don't we give them up. So um, that defeated that whole issue of having a Greater Germany again. And but eventually in the '90s they began. There was more support for nationalist groups because immigration became a bigger issue. They're seeing all these refugees, there's far more refugees. And also East Germany is beginning to experience a lot more of these immigrants coming to their area. There was immigration um, during the GDR, during the East German days, but as soon as the wall fell down, they then began experiencing it more. And there was a lot of uh, conflict and tensions between the immigrant groups. And there was like some refugee hotels burnt down and other things, asylum centers burnt down. Uh, during that time. And this is also the development of skinheads. So you were witnessing that uh, as a thing, but it never really mounted into a, into a core political party. It was more that the CDU is like, we hear you. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to deport more of these migrants and, you know, 
try to tamp down on the immigration issue in the 90s is that the center right responded to the rumblings from the far right by adopting a lot of their positions. I and mean, obviously that didn't get to change the citizenship law, but when the citizenship law changed, the social Democrats were in, were in power. Ever had the government. Gerhard Schroeder was the one who was uh, chancellor. So a little bit of history with that. So the conclusion of that, looking at its 20th century history and how it approached immigration is that it still had an ethno-nationalist outlook, is that it still wanted to keep Germany German, but it was also really insistent on, we need to have a liberal democratic order and we cannot be authoritarian while at the same time cracking down hard on hate speech and bumper stickers that offend people and having to negotiate people's debates over what is who's violating whose human dignity and other things it wasn't maybe the ideal state and i think that's also just due to how you know the war just totally screwed you know screwed germans and and how they looked i mean they got absolutely defeated i mean they got absolutely defeated in two world wars and and it was total it was total defeat and World War II. And that does something to a nation's psychology and, and the way it views itself. And as a country, it's like we are no longer having any type of big, big ambitions. We just kind of want to do our thing. And the leading philosopher of this was Jürgen Habermas, who argued that Europe, specifically German, was now in a post-heroic age and all that really mattered was consumerism and leisure activities. And this is what a state should be uh, focused on uh, managing and, and for people. And that's really how Germany was, is that, well, we're no longer um, trying to go to the East or make ourselves a world power. We're just trying to live a nice life, have some really good schnitzel, buy uh, a nice TV. And that's basically it. And there's no grand project. I mean, even with America, we're very much a consumer society, but we still imagine that America has a grand mission uh, generally, that grand mission is usually something stupid, like spreading democracy around the world. But with Germany, it's just like interdirected. Uh, you know, it's not trying to really influence the world around them. I mean, outside of economics and trade, it's really just trying to, you know, make itself more moral and and atone for its sins. And so that became the reigning ideology, even when Germany was guided by these conservative parties, there were some, there was these elements within the CDU that wanted to have, you know, a great Germany again. And the way that de Gaulle was doing for France, that they wanted a Germany to be, have a really strong military and actually matter and have a degree of independence away from America. Uh, but that didn't really work out. Now going to the AFD, the AFD really is a rejection of the reigning ideology around Germany, because even though the party doesn't like to emphasize this point because they get fined and, and charged with hate speech and also creates a lot of controversy, but as a party, they really do want to move on from an identity that's different from seeing Auschwitz at the core of it and away from the idea that the Holocaust is what is the founding principle of, Amer of I almost said America, of Germany is how, and atoning for those sins is what's most important to Germany because they realize that this is what's allowing open borders and their insane immigration policy right now and is, and is threatening the idea and principle that they wanna have of keeping German Germany German. And many of their leaders have criticized this uh, World War II's hold on the German psyche Alexander Gowlin, who was one of their, who's a former co-leader, he was more retired. It wasn't that he was too controversial. He simply said that the Nazi period was just a bird shit on Germany's great history. And Bjorn Hoeke has made many, many comments on uh, in regards to that. Uh, they don't make this quite the central part because, you know, they're a political party. They're focused on the issues that will get them the most votes. But it, they are a party that's rejecting that consensus that dominated Germany since Adenauer. So they, there's that threat to them. And that's why they think that they're a threat to the constitutional order, because they are rejecting the core principle of the constitutional order, which says that Germany created many, many terrible sins in World War II 
and its mission is to atone for that. And AFD says, we don't need to do that. We need to overcome that history and focus on making Germany great again. And thus the constitutional order is like, no, 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 that's terrible because that reeks of fascism. We cannot tolerate that. And that's why they come down hard on them because they think that they're violating the common good. And as a political party, they're like the ones who are wearing shorts out of season or jaywalking <laughs> and the rest of German society has to come out and nag them. And this, there is some degree of a silent majority that is rejecting liberal immigration laws. And there's a lot of polls showing that a majority of Germans want fewer immigrants. And then what tougher and a vast majority want tougher immigration enforcement. So AFD is representing that, but it's they're not the lone party also that's taking tougher line on immigration. The new leadership of the CDU is also wanting to take a tougher line on immigration, not as tough as AFD, but they they are tougher than the current um, left wing coalition that they have. And the, uh, the Social Democrats have even tried to backtrack from their liberal immigration laws. The Social Democrats came in in 2021 promising that they're going to really liberalize immigration laws. And sure enough, they did that with the new citizenship law that they passed. But they're realizing that they're pissing off the German people and that the, everyone involved in the left wing coalition is getting destroyed in the polls, both the Social Democrats and the Greens. And so while the CDU and AFD are doing pretty well in the polls. So Olaf Scholz now has to go out and like, oh, we're going to we're going to really deport. We're going to really increase the amount of immigrants we're deporting because none of them are getting deported. And it's done as a way of saying, oh, the German people want this. But at the same time, the German people, even though the majority of them want immigration restriction, they still view the AFD as a threat because when there was the re-migration scandal where Martin Sellner, who has been on Highly Respected before, had a meeting with, with AFD leaders and he suggested re-migration as like deporting people who are German citizens from Germany and really, really having a tough line. You know, there were millions of Germans all over throughout the country who marched in protest. And I guarantee you a lot of those Germans who were marching still want less immigration, but they really want to cling to this idea that there's there's limits to that. And also we still must reaffirm Germany as this country that is atoning for its sins of World War II. I would not say that was the majority of people marching, but I think there were people marching in that. And the CDU and all these others were condemning it, you know, who otherwise would, you know, agree with tougher immigration lines. They will say, oh no, re-migration, that's too far. That's too ethno-nationalist outlook of Germany. We, we no longer want that. We're no longer the country that says we are not a country of immigrants. We are a country of immigrants, but we want fewer immigrants. That would be the CDU line. While the AFD is saying, no, we want to restore that old line of that we're a country of, we're not a country of immigrants. As well as dethroning the stranglehold World War II myths have over Germany. And that's really where it comes the big threat. But they're coming up against a very strong opposition towards them, far stronger than any other country. You know, you could see France elect a nationalist in 2027. You can argue whether it's not the most possible scenario, but it's, it is a possible scenario. And you could see, and there is a detoxification of national rally that's happened where, as they're assuming more political power and influence, that France realizes they can no longer have the firewall. You know, their center-right party, the leadership was willing to have a coalition with them. Now, that was rejected by a lot of their other leaders, and there was this huge battle over it. But it's showing that weakening resistance, because in most countries, there's like, there's a firewall. Like, we're not going to cooperate with the far right. But in most countries, that's breaking down. It's broken down and starting to break down in France. It would long broke down in Denmark, where the Nationalist Party was already in a coalition with the center right. But even the left wing, the center left has adopted a lot of the far right's ideas. Sweden, the firewall is broken down. The Swedish Democrats aren't necessarily in the coalition, but they work with the coalition. They kind of had a compromise there. 
the Finns, the far right party in Finland has been welcoming the government coalition. In Austria, the Freedom Party and the People's Party have been in coalitions many times. They've it it, it fell apart in the late 2010s, but now the Freedom Party is more popular than the People's Party, so they'll have to work with each other. And in Italy, they have uh, a, a broad right-wing coalition that includes Lega. Um, so you, you have that firewall breaking down, but it's really where in Germany where it's the most, you know, we're not going to do this. Even the left-wing, the anti-woke left party that has emerged in Germany, which is breaking off from Die Linke, which is the far left party, which is a successor to the Communist Party from East Germany. And, but they're really, uh, you know, they're taking immigration seriously and they want immigration restriction. Even they're like, oh, we'll never cooperate with the AFD. And they're often seen as the uh, respectable AFD for the, for the CDU to build a coalition or government around rather than having to go with the AFD. So there is that strong uh, hurdle and obstacle that they have to overcome. And whether they'll be able to overcome that in the next decade is a, is a big question. It would be a major, major event at the CDU in one of these states formed a coalition government with AFD. It's not going to happen now, but it could happen with it in the next five years. And that would indicate a strong cultural transformation that could potentially happen in Germany where that they are finally overcoming this World War II myth but uh, are the myth that they've built up in the post-war era so this is and so like the final thoughts on this is like going back to the to the uh, debate that's been unleashed about World War II following the Tucker Carlson podcast and the degree it holds on the West and how it's even seen as a foundational event for the West. And you see all these hysteric responses of people from the still like this, this podcast that Tucker did with Martyr Maid, this is like the 1619 Project of the Right where they're attacking our foundations. And it's like, you really want World War II to be the foundation and kind of the Hollywood version of it to be the foundation of our, of our society and our civilization? I don't think so. But a lot of people even left and right more center right. Uh, even someone like Victor Davis Hanson, who's pretty good on a lot of issues, was even uh, arguing or entertaining that position. So it's like even in our society where, you know, we don't. Well, actually, I would change that is that, you know, you'll find like a Holocaust museum in like Arkansas. It's like, why the hell is this here? <laughs> what is this doing here in Arkansas? I mean, we even had like holocaust statues in in nashville and i was like what is this doing here like why do we have this like this doesn't make any sense so it's uh it's somehow become a foundational aspect to america but it is almost in some ways is that with us our way of viewing world war ii is different from germans with germans it's like we shouldn't have any global power we should be wary of even having a military. And they're even having problems now. They're trying to spend up on military to you know, deal with Ukraine, but they have like a very unmilitaristic culture now. It's like completely different. You know, Prussian military, the Prussian spirit has completely died. They no longer have that. They're never gonna turn into a military power. 80 years of, res of not wanting to be a militaristic power and the type of mindset and values that Germans have cultivated has made them not not capable of being a serious military power anymore. And so the, it's the when their World War II ideology is that well we you know we can't be any powerful we have to reje reject any type of authoritarianism while still having authoritarianism <laughs> in our system you know but it's more long housing rather than drill sergeant. A way of doing things and that's it it's like we 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 want to be a weak country uh, but make a lot of money that's essentially it with our world war ii thing we have the same similar moral outlook but it's almost arguing for american global power as the world war ii mythology is never used to say oh america shouldn't be involved in europe oh america should uh, spend less on its military no, it's all about we need to spend more on our military. We need to ensure that we are the 
the dominant superpower and that we're taking out these dictators no matter where they are because remember what happened in world war ii with neville chamberlain and hitler we can't allow that again never again we have to exert ourselves on the world stage even more because of world war ii and so world war ii is a justification for american global dominance which is very different it's like um, you know, it's like a submissive Germany for <laughs> that's the argument for the World War II foundational myth for them. For us, it's about for American global power. And they view this, you know, there is a moral, there's a strong moral element to it. It's, you know, some right wingers claim that due to World War II and the mythology around it and Nuremberg that, you know, it, it banned having a serious right wing state, you know, it banned having ethno-nationalism and immigration restriction and stuff. But, you know, even looking at post-war Europe, there's, you know, that's sketchier. Uh, you know, it's on shakier grounds because of how Germany and even France and the UK were articulating themselves. You know, de Gaulle, Churchill, and Adenauer all wanted to keep their countries white. They wanted to keep their, not only their countries white, but their specific ethnic group. You know, they wanted to keep Britain British, French, France French. Germany, German, you know, and that was, you know, still the predominant outlook up until the new millennium. For the British, it really began with Tony Blair, who Tony Blair wanted immigration to have more diversity, and thus he greatly expanded it. Um, you know, they were having a lot more diversity, uh, immigration diversity, but Tony Blair in the 90s then uh, speed it, uh, accelerated it. Uh, France had also accelerated around the same time and same with Germany. So, you know, it's more of a new millennial thing, which it didn't necessarily happen after the post-war. So I'm a little skeptical about that aspect, but I think the more important thing is the Western order is that these European countries, Europe is no longer a great power. It's no longer really having that much influence over the world outside of economics and trade. Really what World War II, the meaning of it as interpreted in the West is that America is the top dog. America, you know, America is the should be the only superpower. And then anybody who rises up against it is a threat to that world order that we've imposed. So there's a lot of meanings with that. And it's also stipulating that the only form of government that is allowed is liberal democracy. Now, liberal democracy can greatly restrict immigration but it has to be a liberal democracy but even if it go but it is starting to change that because you know hungary is seen as a threat to democracy simply because they restrict immigration but still a liberal democracy you know still they voted for orban uh, so there is that of how it's shifting to you know in the past it would have allowed for stricter immigration it would even allowed for a degree of an ethno nationalist conception of your state but now, due to the new dictates of what's happening and changing an outlook, it's now requiring open borders and a completely multicultural character to all Western countries, to all countries within that order, with the exception of Japan and South Korea, uh, with the exception of the non-white um, countries that would have been included in the American global order. So there is that, because Japan still restricts immigration, still has an extremely na ethno-nationalist outlook to itself, uh, and South Korea does as well. So those are the exceptions. And Singapore, it, so the, basically the non-white countries get exception, but the majority of white countries, uh, they don't get that exception. And so that becomes a, a, a lot of the meaning of World War II, or how liberals and even a lot of some conservatives want to interpret it, uh, its meaning today. So what can we take from this for our Germany, our concluding about Germany? I think there are a lot of right-wingers, uh, or a certain section of right-wingers want to imagine that Germany can be maybe not the Fourth Reich, but, you know, maybe even returning to something like the Wilhelmina, Wilhelmina Empire or something of that set. And there's a lot of right-wingers who you know, by the ideology they adopt, they kind of uh, pretend that they're Germans <laughs> and they see their identity is inherently tied with Germany. I remember two years ago, I used to have these posts like saying, like, look, we're Americans, we're not really Germans. A lot of our stuff comes from Anglos. And there was a lot of people really offended. And I posted this funny soy jack 
meme video with German uh, about Germans. It's it's like harmless humor. It's not supposed to be. It's just something funny. I think even the person who created it was German. And it's got goofy music. And I once posted that. And I had people who were promising me uh, a painful death in the ethno state with if that happened. I don't think that's ever going to happen. But uh, they promised that to me for posting this video. So a lot of these guys, they, they adopt a German identity, even though they don't know German. They're barely even German. They're American. Their people have been here. Even if they are German, their people have been here for like 200 years. Uh, so they just adopt this outlook. And then they come up with a myth a lot, a, a romanticized version of the German. But then if they came in contact with the Germans and learned what they are now, they would have a much more cynical outlook or a much more pessimistic outlook of what they're like and what they are. Because even if you took off the boot of, or the oppressive myth of World War II on Germans, they're still not going to be the dominant power of Germany or dominant power of Europe, and they're not going to return to what they were like pre-World War II. That there has been this fundamental change within Germans, and looking for someone to save Europe, you're probably better off looking towards the French. With, I mean, the Germans are going to need to be needed. If you had a France-German alliance and taking over the EU and making it more nationalist, that would be it. But I think the leadership role would probably be taken up by the French, which the French are not oppressed by World War II. They do not feel that the French identity is about atoning for its past. You know, there's even the government doesn't even like, you know, apologizing for colonialism. You know, it gets very sensitive about this stuff. You know, even Macron, who some people want to think is base, I don't, but he's still libtard, is like, we are not uh, tearing down our heritage and you know you have and there's a very deep hostility towards wokeism and it's seen as an anglo import and so you see that that it's like a much healthier attitude and mentality and, and situation around their national identity and i think with germans that they've had you know 80 years of this and it's deeply corrupted their minds in a way that may be irreversible. But with French, they don't have that. And it's the same with even Italians. But in some of these countries, they don't have the will to, a will to power like the French do. The French still want to be a great power. And so when you're looking at Europe, the only countries that would even be capable of making a difference would be France. And I don't know if it would be making it better, but they do still have a capacity for great power, but it'd be Russia. But obviously Russia, we're seeing what they're doing in Ukraine and we're seeing a lot of the problems that... Uh, it's not as uh, rosy of an outlook or as uh, the type of outlook a lot of people would have had in 2022 with them doing this. And most Europeans are rejecting them. So you would see that like the leadership role would pass more to France than it would be to Germany. So there is an inherent libtardism to Germans now that's been... You know, you can say it was imposed, but guess what? The people have fully adopted it. You can see that with the millions of people marching against remigration. And now there is, you know, a silent majority that wants immigration restricted. And there are, you know, there's at least a third of the country that's open to the AFD. But I think that they're much more limited and mind corrupted than are the French. And so if there's any hope for Europe, it would either be a based American order, <laughs> you know, something happening within America that then creates an influence on Europeans to make them much better, or France takes a leading role and pushes Europe in the right direction. So I would say that. There's all their thoughts I have on this, but I will conclude that that's been an over an hour and we've got a lot of cognitively questions to get to. So we will get to that now. As a reminder, you too can get the power to ask me questions or suggest guests and topics if you sign up for the Cognitively option at Highly Respected Substack. And that's at highly-respected.com and make sure to sign up for the IQ supplements if you haven't already. I know most of you have, so <clears throat> we always like to get to those questions. So we'll start off today with John Chandler. John Chandler has two questions for the regular episode. He says, first, the stories that have popped up regarding Haitians pouring to small towns across the country from Alabama to Ohio. I saw footage on Twitter X showing Alabama residents being criticized by their own city council for asking questions about it. 
Also saw a post that said Haitians in Ohio were seen eating captured animals found on the streets. One photo showed a very magical gentleman walking around with a goose or other bird that he had captured. Curious if you know how accurate all this is. Yeah, it's pretty accurate. I don't know how accurate the spring... Because uh, they are capturing and killing the Canadian geese, which you're not supposed to. It's like a, a pretty big offense to do so. And the guy's just doing it. But people on Reddit are like, thanks, they're an invasive species. It's like uh, they're a protected species. <laughs> not quite endangered, but they are protected. And they're killing them. And there's also been reports that they've been killing in eating cats. There's actually, there was a arrest video of a woman. It's like, why did you eat this cat? And she's like, hmm. Uh, so there are a big cultural clash going on in Springfield, Ohio, which is where all they are, or a lot of them are. The, the town is only 58,000 people, and they've gotten 20,000 Haitians over the last few years. Uh, that's nearly half of the town. You know, that's, um, we won't go into the exact breakdown. Uh, as I said, we don't, we try to avoid math on this, on highly respected, but nearly half. Uh, of this town. I don't even know if that's counted in the new census figures. It probably would be different because it's 58,000 in 2020. Thus, it might be, uh, figures might be different. It might have boosted the the population to 70,000 or so. Uh, that's It's been a town that's been losing a lot of its population, like a lot of these uh, mid-sized cities and towns all throughout the Rust Belt. So it's... Uh, the whole population fusion probably are these Haitians. So I would say it is accurate, and there are a lot of townsmen who are taking, you know, uh, up, I don't know if arms is the correct, correct way to say it, but are, are trying to raise awareness of this and are going to their city council to uh, protest against this, both in Alabama and in Ohio. And there's a clash there. There's a cultural clash that's happening in the general community because also these Haitians in Springfield, where it's most documented, they're horrible drivers. One of them caused a, a, a school bus accident that killed a young kid last year. And the guy was like driving on the wrong side of the road and, and stuff like that. And they're just and there's numerous, you know, posts about how terrible drivers these guys are. And, you know, the city isn't properly enforcing, the, you know, correct regulations for them to get licensed, but they get licenses anyway. And so there's just a massive problem. And then a lot of them are taking jobs and they're ca causing problems with housing. They're taking up a lot of the housing and actually landlords are preferring to give them housing rather than to give it to local residents, to native residents. So there are those issues so it's a, so it's very accurate the one thing i noticed is that there's a, even a, a political clash here because there's those who are like accept them and this is even happening in, and this is happening in alabama too where it's like well we've got to be accepting of them it's racist to complain about them killing geese and eating them in public uh and cats and you just gotta accept who they are and you know whatever um that's racist to care about them and they're so good for the economy uh, of course, they're bringing out that argument. They're uh, deploying that argument. It's got to think about the economy above all all their considerations. They're definitely deploying this down in Alabama, which red state more likely to nod their head along to that argument. But even though they are making these arguments, and this is just something that a lot of people aren't well equipped to to say this is a problem because there's a lot of you know there's always the liberals and redditors who are going to make these arguments but even a lot of like ordinary middle americans just don't know how to respond to this case because it's like this is something they're just like totally not used to and you know there is this strong social taboo against even appearing racist and so they're struggling with it but there's still residents who are taking up and making very strong arguments against it uh in the uh you know springfield city council meetings where residents have shown up to protest the Haitians you know a lot of them are like they're invading our city this is our city they're low IQ they suck like this is bad there is even a black guy who was wearing a hoodie he was like he even had the hood over a flat bill hat very um, magical way of dressing and this guy gave a, a powerful argument against the new immigrant it's, uh, which is uh, was humorous in effect but he made a, he made a decent argument against them there's still residents are protesting or overlooking the racist angle. I think if it's a black guy, obviously it's going to be hard to call him racist, but people will be there. So there's these people who are 
trying to figure out the correct language and rhetoric to utilize against them. And while the leaders are simply just saying, there's no problem here, they came here legally. There's uh, one of the guys in Alabama and the places that they were uh, there, you know, the mayor's like, we're not a sanctuary city, but all these guys are coming here legally. Thus, we can't do anything. And they're contributing to the economy. And, you know, that's just ridiculous. And so some town residents are still, you know, they're figuring out the way it is, but there is this groundswell of opposition. And it does show what's happening in these middle American towns. Like everywhere is a border, t border town. Everywhere in this country is affected by open borders, by mass immigration. There is no place immune from this. And so you, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you could go in some of these places like Kansas or Nebraska or even some of these places in Alabama and you would never see any immigrant. Now you can go to these places and there are schools where they're majority Hispanic or where, you know, Haitians are now a large part of the school population. Even in that town in Springfield, you know, of new students, Haitians are starting to be, are nearing to the majority. And so I think in elementary school or one of the places as of new students, that's also creating problems for room for other kids. Um, so, and they're also having to spend more money on these kids because, you know, they're going to have to learn English. They don't know English. And that's a depleting resources that could be used on other kids. Uh, so this is just a problem that's across the board. And, uh, you know, I've gotten arguments before about people are like, oh, you know, this this just isn't is an issue for other places in America. It's just an issue for the Southwest. And it's like, actually, it's an issue for every single part of this country, even in places in North Dakota, they're experiencing this. Well, I mean, they've had, I think it was you know, Fargo and some of the other areas have had problems with African immigrants in these like Great Plains, extremely white states. They have these problems. Even Montana and Idaho have these problems. There's no play. There are there are some towns that you can find that are not affected by this. But I all ever all 50 states are affected by this. And so it's an issue that is very, that you just can't ignore, that you can't just pretend, oh, it's only restricted to one area. Oh, it's weird for someone in South Dakota to care about this. They aren't affected by this. No, everywhere is affected by this. Everywhere is a border state and everywhere is affected by mass immigration. And I think that's why it's useful from this cases of Springfield and Alabama that's coming up. And I think actually the rhetoric, you know, the right wing rhetoric, I always say, you know, I've always pointed out like a lot of stuff that we're seeing uh, in mainstream right is now like alt right commentary from uh, 2016. You know, we saw that with the Martyr Made uh, Tucker podcast. And we're even seeing this with the reaction to the Springfield stuff. It's like all this rhetoric that would have only been coming from alt right accounts seven years ago. It's now being used by mainstream conservative influencers, you know, saying like they're ethnically cleansing. Uh, you know, um, I was about to say rural spring, Ohio. It's not rural Springfield, but small town Ohio, they're ethnically cleansing and stuff. So there's a greater awareness of this and this stuff. Um, more of the right cares about it and more Americans are upset about it than they would have been 10 years ago. But they're still trying to figure out how the correct rhetoric for it without uh, sounding racist. And still there are a number of people who are uncomfortable with this, but they're not sure how to talk about it. But there are others who are showing the way. Now, the second question from John, he uh, is asking, um, what are my thoughts on American POWs left behind in, in Vietnam? Apparently, evidence abounds that at least hundreds of American soldiers were left behind in Vietnam and Laos after the war. I even saw information that these men were alive well into the 80s and even early 90s, and U.S. officials may have worked to cover this up, most notably John McCain, as if one needed another reason to despise him. Apparently, the Arizona senator, fearing testimony would be brought to light that would contradict his own POW story, worked in the early 90s to suppress attempts by families of lost soldiers to raise this, the issue further with Congress. The most successful info on this all seems to be articles by noted journalist Sidney Schamberg, whose work famously became the 1980s movie, The Killing Fields. I have posted a link to one of Schamberg's articles at the bottom, just in case, but certainly no need to read it as it is quite long. But curious to hear your thoughts 
on the POW question. That is a question that I definitely need to read up more on. It's always been a common debate. It was also a very right wing thing. The fact that like POW MIA flags are around, it's those are right coded. And there was like this talk back in the 2010s that they're like, oh, those are white supremacist symbols because they were associated with the far right. And thus they try to ban them, which uh, obviously was bad optics on the part of the left. But it was a big issue in the 80s. And also the second Rambo movie is about him going to rescue American POWs that the government left behind and only Rambo can go and save them. So there, were, it was a very popular thing within America in the 80s, and it's died out since then. How many we left behind is something there. I think it also, with McCain, I think he just didn't want people to have evidence of what they had given away, that maybe he had been under torture and given away, you know, things about other soldiers and uh, had made statements that would, if there was more attention towards it, it would hurt his political career. So there is that. And that they might have actually killed soldiers and other things that he just didn't want them to uh, be aware of. <clears throat> so, yeah. And also, they were also worried that, you know, at the time of the 80s and 90s, they were trying to make good with Vietnam and make Vietnam one of our allies. And successfully, they did so. Um, I mean, Vietnam is now one of our close, uh, best, uh, strongest allies in Asia. <laughs> and even though we fought this horrible war with them for well over a decade, even more than a decade, you know, we were st we had American involvement in the late fifties. So, yeah, but now it was it was part of that. They're like, oh, we're not going to try to rile up the population about Vietnamese misdeeds when we're trying to build up relations with Vietnam. So there's also that part of that, but it's also very suspicious that uh, Mr. POW would have wanted to not um, tamp down on any questions around what happened to some of these missing POWs. So it's definitely a question that I, you know, it's definitely something I could do an IQ supplement on later on, but I don't have a definite answer on how many soldiers I felt were left behind. Uh, it probably would have been that a lot of they killed a lot of soldiers, maybe more soldiers than we thought. And it would have been uh, not a good thing to have if we're with our foreign pol uh, for our foreign relations if this was if we were a lot of focus to it. And we just didn't want to relitigate the past, so it was shut, shut to the sign. I don't know how many of these guys would have been kept alive you know i i think that they were just that they had just killed them and maybe they and they had just maybe in executions and all the things and we really didn't want to focus on that as we were trying to build up relations with vietnam that would be my initial response to this i could it could be changed uh, my mind could be changed about that and other things on our clearer statement but i would just say i need to do read a lot more on this on this issue before coming up with a definitive statement of opinion and i i think it would be it could be possible iq supplement down the line so that would be my answer to that now we're going to go on to you guessed it k max k max has got a lot of questions today so we'll go to his four first he said Scott, the second Russia gate happened. And if this is a topic, um, well, he's talking about interference with Russia. He's kind of referring to the Lauren Chen tenant media stuff. And I assume many foreign countries play influencers at times they do. Is this an issue that Russia is a sanctioned country or more of a problem with paperwork? Uh, how should we react to this? Um, it's more that we're just like an enemy of Russia. I mean, you could say, you know, Israel, it's sometimes it's not so much the government itself paying at the interest, but people associate with Israel. And you could say, well, Farah, I think that's a fair point. Saudi Arabia, 100 percent is paying a lot of conservative influencers. I mean, the people are compl the funniest thing is the people who are complaining about this are also getting paid by foreign actors like Dave Reboy who got paid by Hungary and gets paid by Saudi Arabia and likely gets paid by Saudi Arabian interest. Anyone who complains about Qatar, which they're all talking about, 
or cutter. However, we're going to say I prefer Qatar. And every person who's complaining about Qatar is generally get paid by Saudi interest to complain about Qatar. And then they're like, we need to focus also. This is really bad. We also need to focus on the Qatari influence. It's like, we need to focus on who's paying you to care about Qatar. Because <laughs> nobody is, who is complaining about Qatar a lot, very few people who are complaining about Qatar a lot are not getting paid by a foreign actor too. And it's generally Saudi interest, also some Israeli interest in there as well. So you have a lot of these guys who are definitely getting paid by foreign interest who are complaining, even like Jordan Schachtel, who's got connections, also has Saudi interests and even Israeli interests there. And they're all like, how dare Lauren Chen take money from Russia for this? Um, even in that case, uh, you've got to be careful. It's, a, it's another example of like, you should not uh, take money from Russians because you open up a whole can of worms that you just don't want to deal with. Some of this could be problem with paperwork. It's also that we view Russia as, you know, the American government views Russia as an enemy as compared to Saudi Arabia and Israel, uh, Turkey, Turkey's all, uh, they're not paying necessarily influencers. They pay columnists. There's also been top notch columnists who've been paid by other col um, by other Gulf states. Uh, there was a guy who was like an editor of foreign policy or foreign affairs who was getting paid by the UAE, and they do this all the time. So there's a lot of that going on. But a lot of them register or properly register, and some of this could be improper registration. It's also that it's a state that the U.S. government is obsessed with, and they are also wanting to prove this Russia interfering in our election. I don't think, it, obviously, to any intelligent person, them paying influencers to make videos that didn't even get that many views. A lot of their view videos, you know, they're paying uh, an insane amount of money for these videos. And they're getting like 5K views on YouTube. And you're like, man, this is uh, not, you're not getting your bang for your buck here. So I couldn't say that they're getting a uh, election interference. And I also, there's like people who are like, oh, this Tim Pool rant, this is definitely written by the Kremlin. I, I, I'm skeptical of this. I, He's responding to what his audience was here and also what he even believes. I don't think that, now it could be proven wrong. I don't think Russia was directly writing scripts for anyone of any of these types. They're just doing standard conservative right-wing content and that was it. But the fact that they're taking $10 million from Russians, Russia is considered an enemy state and it could have counted as, uh, something that needed to be registered under FARA, and they didn't. So uh, that creates problems. And it also is obviously leading to a lot of uh, government interests in them. So yeah, it's uh, something you gotta be careful about. Um, I, it's, I don't know how much of it is gonna be playing in the election. I would have thought that this would be a bigger story for the election, but it doesn't appear that it's quite going to be as an election story of, I mean, the liberal media, I mean, liberal media is going to claim that, oh, Russia controls conservative influencers. I think that's going to be a theme throughout for a while, uh, but I don't think it's going to have much impact in the election. So messy, Kate, messy story. I don't really have a you know definitive uh, statement opinion about this, <laughs> except uh, it's not wise to take money from foreign um, actors, no matter who it is, uh, especially if, and it becomes more of a concern if the USG views those foreign actors as an enemy. Um, so you always got to be careful with that. That's all I meant. I, I don't. I I'm not passing judgment on Chen or anyone else. Um, you know, are condemning and I was like, oh, thank you FBI for going after this. Because this might not be, there might not be no crime here that um, Chen and others committed, you know, and it's also a presumption of innocence. So I don't really know what's going on. Um, and I, I, I could tell you that if this had been Saudi Arabia or, or Israel, or even Qatar or, or any of these other states that are, have been involved in this stuff. Obviously, the FBI would have not even arrested anyone involved. 
there might have been some investigation over them and not re registering under FARA. But they wouldn't have this whole uh, media bonanza over it. So that's my opinion on that. Uh, second K-Max question. Uh, I know you somewhat discussed this before about Michael Steele and how cable news politics people switch their politics. I still ask about the complete 180 Steele has done from being chairman of the RNC to supporting far left Kamala Harris and being leftist on every single position. Did Steele never believe what he used to preach? Is it just Trump or is it money and MSNBC paying him to switch? The blow tweet uh, shows Steele doesn't even believe in free speech anymore. Michael Steele is just not really that important. But I mean, uh, Michael Steele, he... He's been liberal for well over 10 years because he was an RNC chair and he got pushed out for being incompetent at the job. He was basically picked as a token hire to be like, oh, we've got a black guy as RNC chair. And then he did a terrible job at it and then he got forced out and then he got a job at MSNBC. And he was always been the respectable Republican who's who's going against the far right in the Tea Party. And so I remember even when I was working at Caller, the Daily Caller, and they always had MSNBC and CNN on. And they're, you know, they're broadcasting it. And Michael Steele would go on. It's like, these crazy Republicans. This is why I'm leaving the party. And this is pre-Trump. So it was already pre-Trump. And all these guys who became the Republican commentator on MSNBC were already anti-Republican before Trump had come down the escalator. So, you know, they had already made their switch. And... You know, they are peeved at how they feel that they were wronged by Republicans and conservatives. So they're more willing to vote Democrat. And at the same time, that's what their audience wants to hear. So it's, a little, it's, it's just kind of a lot of the things. I mean, they even had David Jolly who goes on MSNBC a lot. And that guy was a Tea Party congressman. And then he you know, didn't like Trump and he's gone full far left. So he went from Tea Party to uh, same position as Michael Steele and endorsing Kamala Harris. So they all went in that direction. You see this a lot with politics is people get scorned. People feel like they're wronged and thus they move into the direction of being anti everything they used to believe in. So that's uh, uh, so what it happens. Uh, now we got a question from Jack. Jack asks, what do you think will happen with Trump's sentencing later this month? Well, the news changed and now it's delayed until after the election. I don't, I honestly have no earthly idea. I mean, if he wins the presidency, I, I, they can't sentence him to jail. Also, like Secret Service, like even if he doesn't win the presidency, he has Secret Service detail. And the, what, they can't house like five agents with him in the same jail cell. So I don't know, you know, they're more willing to do this. They really want to send him to jail, but I don't know what they would, they could order him for house arrest. How are they going to order the president to house arrest into 1600 Pennsylvania? I don't, I, the, the judge clearly wants to send him to jail, but then there's a secret service detail there. And if he wins the presidency and if he wins the election, you know, what, what's going to happen there? And I think on an appeal and he won, another judge, even even a Democrat is like, we're not sending our president to jail, uh, even if it is Trump. So my guess would be he is not sent to jail. Now, if he loses, but I think he's going to win. So I don't, even if he does try to send him to jail, he's just not going to be sent to jail. Um, that would be my, my uh, argument on that. Um, but even if he loses, I think it's going to be very difficult to send him to jail. So I don't know. I generally, it, it, it's truly up to, it's truly a matter of what happens in the election. I think this judge will have the good sense to not send him to, to just be like, you have a fine or something. If he, um, if he wins the election, that would be my guess, but maybe I'm too optimistic on this. So that's from Jack. We've got one final question. Anything else will be for the mailbag. We got Dollar Bill. He says, with America's changing demographics, do you think the Demo Democrats will start introducing the, the use of anti-white pejoratives in the political discourse? Imagining 
Imagine Kamala at a campaign event where she jokingly refers to white voters as Ofes or Mayo Monkeys. I began wondering this after that bizarre video of Tim Walz talking about white guy tacos and his claim white people can't tolerate anything spicier than black pepper. I don't think so, dude, because one, they're so dependent on a single college educate white women to uh, to come over to the Democrats. And also they're really trying hard to win over college educated whites in general. And they don't want to be calling them, hey, crackers. You know, they're not going to be calling crackers. What they're going to be doing, what they're going to be doing instead is the Tim Walsh guy of being like, I'm a lame white guy, but I vote Democrat. And they're just going to do like, hey, we're lame ass white dudes, but we're voting for the black lady. That's more what they're going to do. It's more going to be more white menstrual show than anti-white vitriol. So Tim Walsh is more of the future than a guy going out there and ripping into whites and the Karens. Like they need the care. They want the Karen vote. So they're not going to be talking about Karens. Uh, they would only use Karen against like a Republican opponent. It's like this Karen wants to call the cops on blacks just living their lives. It would only be directed towards individual Republican candidates that they're opposing. It would not be towards the voters because Democratic strategy is trying to, for at least the rest of the decade, is going to be trying to win over more of the college-educated white vote. And that's even Kamala's strategy right now. And so they're definitely not going to be calling them male monkeys. But the 10 wall stuff, you're going to see every white male. Democrat do this. And so in 2028, because Kamala's going to lose, as we all know, there's going to be a lot of white male Democrats running or, you know, they're counted as white on the census. I can already hear it was like, Josh Shapiro is not white, but, you know, he's going to claim he's white and he's going to be saying, and so you're going to have Newsom, you're going to have a lot of other guys running and they're all going to be doing, <laughs> you know, I'm a lame white guy, but guess what? I believe in social justice. So they're all going to be doing that type of waltz thing. It might not be as ridiculous, but they're all going to be talking about like, you know, as a lame white guy and then go on to their spiel. So that's more of the future. And that is it for Highly Respected today. So we've got more great content in the future or for this week. We will be on a regular schedule this week. Uh, unless some breaking news happens and I have to do an emergency broadcast IQ supplement again like last week, but I don't expect that. So we'll have column Tuesday, mailbag Wednesday. Mailbag will probably, hopefully, the, uh, I will ensure there's a question about the debate. So we'll probably be talking a lot about the debate for the mailbag. I might save up some of the other mailbag questions for the IQ supplement this week. We'll see. And then we'll have a column and then the IQ supplement. So lots of great content, so be on the lookout. So until next time. Stay respected.